Hi, I'm John Schreiber. For 18 seasons, the New Jersey Performing Arts Center has been the state's premier home to world-class and community-centered performances. We pride ourselves on presenting something for everyone. That's why we're proud to partner with the Caucus Educational Corporation to produce One on One with Steve Adubato at NJPAC. This unique series features some of the best talent New Jersey has produced. We're pleased to welcome them and you to the Arts Center. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato at NJPAC has been provided by TD Bank, United Airlines, Verizon Communications, The Fidelco Group, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, Cohn Resnick, Accounting, Tax and Advisory, where forward thinking creates results, and by the law firm of Gibbons PC. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. You see, you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. Man, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. Hi, Steve Adubato coming to you from the New Jersey Performing Arts Center. This is One on One. It is my honor and pleasure to introduce Helene Stepinski, who's the author of Five Finger Discount, A Crooked Family History. Really? Really. <laughs> uh, you grew up in Jersey City, New Jersey. Jersey City, yeah. And we're taping in Newark. That's not too far not from Not far here. at all. I used to cover trials, actually, of the politicians from Jersey City who were prosecuted in Newark. <laughs> really? Fascinating <laughs> so. family history. I'm going to get right into it. Mm -hmm. um, who's Beansy? Beansy is the guy on the cover of my book. Um, he's my grandfather. Right here, look at this. He was the worst criminal of them all. That's a childhood photo, so he doesn't look so bad there. But He, he was, committed crimes after this? Uh, many. Like, <laughs> many such as crimes. What? He was probably on his way from <laughs> committing a crime then. What kind of crimes? Uh, well, he tried to kill us when I was five. What? The book opens with that. It, book, it opens with him uh, with a gun in the Majestic Tavern above which we lived when I was a kid. And um, he'd had a fight with my dad, and long story short, um, he was just going to kill us all. He was completely insane, basically. Like, clinically? Yeah, yeah he was, I mean, we, we never got a diagnosis. This was the 70s, you know, things were still sort of, you know, we think he was bipolar, we're not really sure. But um, he'd had a long criminal history up until then, and that was really his last crime. He was, he was old by then, and he was dragged away by the cops. I watched from the kitchen window as they took Grandpa away. But, That's but, one of my first memories. So. But Beansy, your grandfather, hmm, um, was only one. Yes. Because your great-grandmother, Vita, yeah. M murder? We think so, yeah. She... What do you mean we think so? <laughs> what is this? She was in southern Italy. Kind of southern thing? Italy. It was far away. Uh, she's my great-great-grandmother. She was from Italy? She was, gra yeah, she was Beansy's grandmother. And so she apparently killed someone in Italy and escaped to America with Beansy's dad so, and another son. And so we think she was the first family criminal, but we don't. I'm actually researching that right now. <laughs> so I just came back from southern Italy. So. Well, here's my question. Mm -hmm. You're in Jersey City. Right. And by the way, with other people, your cousin uh, Jerry was a swindler, 200 grand he stole from some people, right? Right. Uh, Aunt Katie, political fixer in Jersey City. Yeah. For whom? She worked for the Hague administration Frank early Hague. on. Yeah, Frank, Frank Hague. Yeah. I am the law. Hague. Exactly. And then after him, she worked for John V. Kenney. I don't know if you remember yeah, Kenney. John V. Kenney, he, he sort of carried it over 40s, from right. Hague, the corruption. He ran against the Hague machine, but he pretty you know, much you did the Board same Walk stuff. If you watch Boardwalk Empire, you'll know some of these characters. Hague are in is in there. there, exactly. Hague is one of the characters. Um, Terrence Winter actually is a fan of my book. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. that's a good fan. But, uh, Anyway, yeah, Aunt Katie used to get the vote out for Haig and for Kenny or whoever she worked for, but um, basically what they would do is they put ashes on the handle of the voting lever. And if you came out of the booth and you didn't have ashes on your finger, that meant you voted for the wrong person. Are you and serious? And she would check that and you'd get your butt kicked. You how, know? Did you know, how did you know all this? <laughs> oh, family stories. You know, I interviewed 12 million people. Um, a lot of stories that I was told were recorded in the newspaper or in court records or you know criminal records. So what would happen was a family member would tell me a story and then I would go and back up the research and find it. So here's my interest. My question. I was interested as, as re, was reading the book. I thought, okay, Helene's writing this book. And now it's, is there a movie involved? Oh yeah, there's a, a documentary being made, which is why I'm here today. You're raising money <laughs> yeah. for that, right? Yeah, yeah. As we speak. Yeah. So your family could not be thrilled about this. 
actually, you know, my immediate family is fine. They, they actually helped me write the book. You know, if, I, if it hadn't been for my immediate family, I wouldn't have had those stories. As I was writing the book, I would call them and ask them questions, and I continue to do today. You know, I mean, I'm always writing something. I'm always calling someone. And my mom was a great help. You know, a lot of the stories came from her originally. She would tell me a story, and then I'd go to the library or, you know, go to the courthouse and look it up, and there it was, you know. Um, so the immediate family was fine. I had a couple of cousins early on who weren't thrilled. You know, they called me and gave me a hard time. But they weren't in the book. <laughs> they had nothing really to complain about. I was like, whatever. Are you yeah. embarrassed by your family? Not at all, no. I what mean, do you mean, not at all? You got murderers and fixers, I mean, and who stole money from yeah, other people? Yeah, there's a lot of good people, too. You know, it's like... Well, are you embarrassed by those who were stone-cold criminals I and hurt other be. people? I used to be. I used to be. You know, when I was younger, I sort of was running away from the whole thing and from Jersey City in general. And then I went to graduate school at Columbia to the MFA program, and you know all these people were writing about how their parents drank on the weekends and ignored them, blah blah blah. blah. So, oh, too bad for you, you know. And <laughs> and then I started writing these stories, and my professors were like, "Oh my God, this is gold! You know, this is great stuff." And my first reaction was like, "No, I don't really want to do this." You know, they would assign a story about your dad or your whatever, an uncle I had to write a story, and this stuff started to bubble out, you know. And they were like, this is your book. This is what you need to write about. And I was just kind of in denial. I was like, no, I don't want to do that. Because I, you know, I was embarrassed about it. Sure. And the longer I looked at it, though, it was over a number of years, I was like, wait a minute. These are my stories, you know. And this is my voice. And this, this is what happened. And I'm going to tell the story. What's you know? been the reaction so far, not just from your family, but about Jersey City? Because Steve Phillip is the mayor yeah. in Jersey City. Uh, we also have the mayor, actually, the mayor of Newark, Ross Baraka, is right, in the right, right. Uh, green room, about to come in to do this interview. Oh, really? and they have I a great see. relationship. Okay, and um, Jersey City and Newark are always competing yeah, for who has exactly. the larger population. Right, right. There's a history of corruption in both right, exactly. cities. Jersey City is an incredibly embarrassing and long tradition, not a proud tradition of corruption. Does that mean anything to you? I mean, I, the thing with the documentary that's been really fascinating is we're kind of taking the book to the next level because the book was written 10 years ago, 11 years ago, and um, things were still pretty bad back then in Jersey City, corruption-wise. Sure. And I think it's kind of come a long way in a lot of different ways, not just via corruption, but I, I mean, Jersey City's pretty much unaffordable for me right now. I mean, it, it's gotten you so nice. Because of the development that I yeah, and I mean, it's, how it's real so estate nice, value you know? is so... Yeah, I mean, well, it's... that's part of the town. Yeah, it is part of it. But, I mean, it's really come a long way since I wrote the book. You know what I mean? So the, the documentary's not just covering the book, but what's happened since the book, you know? And, you know, like you said, not the whole city's like that. Um, there are definitely big pockets that aren't so nice still and have serious problems. And I think... I love Philip. I think he's a great guy. Steve Philip. Yeah, I've met him many times, and uh, he's totally behind the project. And I think one of his greatest challenges is sort of, you know, getting the city together in that way. I mean, you've got the high-end stuff happening, and then you've got the stuff that really needs work, you know, and taking that money from the high-end stuff and helping solve those problems. And what I do you want to accomplish, sorry for What would you like to accomplish with the movie and people continue to talk about the history of corruption in Jersey City? What do you want to accomplish? With the movie? I don't know. I guess to get Jersey City its due, you know what I mean? Let, let people know that it was this bad place for a long time. It was corrupt, but it's not like that anymore, and it's trying to make so a comeback. So you're upbeat about Jersey City? I am, actually, yeah. I love but, Jersey City. And I've always loved Jersey City. I mean, I kind of bad it a lot in the book because, I mean, I grew up in there in the 70s. You know, it was a, and rough, you live it was now? a rough time. I live in Brooklyn, which is very There's never similar. any corruption in Brooklyn. No, not... <laughs> That was they a hide joke. It. They hide it better. <laughs> New York Jersey City, City was out front. It. It's bigger. Jersey City is a smaller place. Yes. It's more out there. You know, it's Clearly. not as savvy, maybe. Um, what was the name of the hospital where all the kids were born? That's where I was born. Margaret. The Margaret Haig. Margaret Haig Hospital. <laughs> yeah, everybody named from Jersey Frank City. Haig, Frank Haig's right? mother. Did it for his wife. His, his mother. His mother. His mother. Not even his wife, his, his mother. mother. Good call. <laughs> yes. Little tip. You got me on that one. Yeah, yeah. Helene Stepinski, author of Five Finger discount <laughs> a crooked family history i want to thank you so much and wish you thank all you. the best with the uh, with the film thank you so much Good thanks stuff. for having me well this is nj pack this is hey more. you gotta have never me. any corruption here <laughs> we'll be back right after this from thanks. nj pack thanks so much that was fun to see more one-on-one -on -one with steve adubato programs visit us online at steveadubato.org if you would like to express an opinion email us at info at caucusnj.org find us on facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato.
We're pleased to welcome two very special guests. Uh, Paul Profeta is the uh, owner of Duke's Southern Table, also the uh, publisher of Radius Magazine, and Vonda McPherson, the owner of Duke's Southern Table, and also the chef and owner of Vonda's Kitchen. Yeah. Welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. This is a series we're doing called Nork at a Crossroads. Um, by the way, I should show the Radius Magazine. It's a pretty special edition of it. Um, get this, Bob, if you could. This is uh, Radius Magazine. And uh, on the cover is our great friend, we miss him, Dear. Dr. Clement Price from Rutgers University, um, the late, great Clement Price. Mm -hmm. Special guy. Yeah, you know? Very special. Very special. We'll be doing uh, a special about his life down the road pretty soon. Let me ask you, tell me about the restaurant, Duke's Southern Table. Where did the idea come from? It was my idea. <laughs> it was my idea. So you're responsible. It was my idea, and then I found Vonda. I needed someone who could execute it, and she's just been brilliant. But it troubled me that there was no soul food restaurant in Newark. We should make it clear. When you say it's you, you are about the business of finding business opportunities, situations that spurred economic development in the city. Correct. Go ahead. I, I have a foundation that I've partnered with Rutgers Business School to launch minority businesses in Newark. And we've launched 11, and Dukes is one of them. Normally, the merchants, the aspiring merchants, come to the foundation with an idea, and we back them. This is an idea that I had. When I saw Jay's go out of business, and I saw soul food die, I said, this is just uh, the silliest thing. Uh, 125, 150,000 African Americans, no soul food place to eat, no black owned and operated restaurant. Just doesn't make any sense. If we execute this right, it, we can't miss. What happened when he came to you? <laughs> That's funny. She was I, I'm interested all in. right away. No, <laughs> no, you were not. I had to lure no, her. No, because I had I have a very successful Vonda's Kitchen is very successful business, and I also had a catering company, and so. Uh, I really wasn't interested in another restaurant, per se. And um, so I had to, yeah. So Paul and I, when he told me about it, I said, OK. And I just smiled. And then I eventually, um, we started talking. And we started meeting and getting to know each other. And what I was, was telling hook? about what I knew about the city as far as restaurants from having one. And um, I thought his idea was excellent. And excellent. the idea, describe it. Well, the idea was to have a venue where African Americans could come and network and, you know, just have a good time. And we always wanted to bring, everyone wants to bring jazz back. As you know, Newark has been the cornerstone for jazz for many years. And so Paul actually had a lot of history on that, and he was telling me about it. And uh, we thought it would be a great venue to, to you know, just to bring back to Newark and to kind of lift the spirits of the people that were here and give them a nightlife. And uh, surprisingly, we met for almost a year. Really? Yes. Yeah, the planning, yes. planning went on for a year. Yeah. She and a decorator named Terry did the whole planning and layout of the restaurant. And then, of course, she's totally in charge of running the restaurant. And um, it's, you know, she's, she is the real uh, Dukes. So let me ask you something. <laughs> Yeah. In this city that mm -hmm. you love and that you care deeply about as well, you're not born and raised here. You're born and raised where? Maplewood. But you have memories of this place. Oh, yes. I spent my childhood downtown Newark. Tell folks what that was like. It was a wonderful city then. My, I'm 70, so my childhood was the 50s. Newark was one of the great cities of the country. Mm. People don't believe this. Retail rents on Broad Street and the Lincoln Park section were higher than Fifth Avenue. This was a bustling, active, energetic city. You, 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 it was hard to walk on Halsey Street. The foot traffic was so dense. And it was like surgical. 67 changed that dramatically. The revolt and the change and the white flight. That's right. And people ran to the suburbs and were afraid to come back. And now, for the first time, you're starting to see people come back. What are you feeling right now? We're at the Performing Arts Center, which is uh you know, uh, such an integral part of the success of this city, but it's just a piece of a much larger mosaic. What do you feel in the city right now? 
I feel the energy of the city, especially with all the new ventures that have moved into the city, we're on the right direction. We're, we're going in a direction that really brings people back to mm. Newark and they're getting, they're getting the vibe that we're trying to create. You know, something very new, something very positive, something very safe. And um, right now, being downtown on Clinton Street, I get to see this. I mean, it's, it's amazing to see how many people, especially with the PAC and also with the Potential Center. Colleges and just, too. Yes, the college. college town. Yeah, college town, all the new restaurants. We have five new restaurants Our just on Market at the, Street. Uh, NJTV are, yeah. are expanding their operation, coming down here. Yeah. You know, to build a studio here. And yeah. You feel it, don't you? By the way, Radius Magazine dedicated to telling that story? Absolutely. We're, we're trying to counteract the negative press of some of the other periodicals. I won't mention any names, but they're obvious. Uh, mm -hmm. We're trying to, to promote the positive things about Newark. What's good about Newark? Why being in the suburbs is sterile and why this is such a wonderful experience to come down here. There's things here you can't find in the Short Hills Mall. Yeah. So I want to be clear, nothing against the Short Hills Mall. We want everyone <coughs> up in that area watching us on um, public broadcasting. <laughs> but, but, but there's something about the city. And you mentioned the issue of uh, safe. Mm -hmm. I'm going to open up a Pandora's box. We had Roz Baraka, the mayor, earlier mm -hmm. sitting here talking about a whole range of issues, crime, one of them. How do you write and talk about that here in the magazine? And how do you deal with that as a business person, knowing that it is something people deal with, their fear of the city? White people in the suburbs have an image that all of Newark is violent. They don't understand that the violence occurs in the burned out sections of the South Ward, and the Central Ward, and the West Ward, but that the University Heights section, the Business District, the Ironbound, are as safe as any major city. They're at no risk coming here. They're at no risk coming to a PAC performance or a rock. And yet, they'll drive on 280 through Newark <laughs> to Madison Square Garden to watch the Rangers instead of coming here and watching the Devils. It's just ignorance. They don't realize. There's 50,000 students that come here every day to learn. And there's 100,000 administrators. All the colleges here. Yes. Yeah. You know, there's Essex County College, there's Seton Hall NJIT. Law. NJIT. There's a huge Rutgers campus. You don't hear of students getting, uh, vi That's being right. victimized by violence. You don't hear of business people being victimized by violence. These kinds of violent incidents involve gang members and they're drug related. And they are in sections that you shouldn't be in anyway. And it has to be dealt with anyway. Mm -hmm. But Correct. you are talking about a different part of town. Von, before I let you out of here, you well, believe in this town. I love this town. I love the city of Newark. I think it's vibrant. And I certainly think that I've been here. I was born in Newark, but I have had a business here for three years now. And I've not had one issue. Hmm. And I am actually more in the urban community and the central ward. And I've not had any, not one issue. And downtown, I, I, I certainly know that I've not even heard of someone having issues downtown Newark. So I think that a lot of times when the media gets a hold of something that might have happened anywhere, I just think it's, it's kind of difficult because we get a lot of bad press on hmm. the safety. And I just haven't had any friends or people that pretty much have had any difficulty here. Well, you can talk about, uh, you know, people can talk about uh, Newark or they want to talk about investing in a city, but until people like you um, invest and people like you decide that you're all in as well, it doesn't happen. So, uh, Paul and Vaughn, I want to thank you for joining us. And as Newark is, in fact, at a crossroads, uh, we have reason to be hopeful when people like you are on board. I would say we've passed the crossroads. With all that's going on in Newark, mm. Haynes, Whole Foods, 15 Wash, yes. the, mar uh, the Four Corners, Teacher's Village. We've passed it and we're rolling downhill. And the work continues. Thanks so much. Stay right there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, one on one, one on two in this case, <laughs> from NJ Pack continues right after this. Thank you very much. Great job. To see more one on one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Steve Adubato here with uh, Barry Ostrowski, uh, the Chief Executive Officer from Barnabas Health. Barry, talk to us about the Valor Awards, why they are so significant. Once a year, we honor firefighters and members of the burn unit team at St. Barnabas Medical Center. We all know firefighters are very special people, brave every day, heroes on occasion, 
But I will tell you, we need to raise the visibility of those who do this for our communities. And so this is an opportunity where we're allowed to party and dine with firefighters from across the state, acknowledge many of the leaders of the firefighting community, and they in turn honor those who work at the state's only burn unit, the only certified burn center in New Jersey at mm -hmm. St. Barnabas Medical Center. So it's a family affair. We've been doing it for over 35 years. Uh, and for us, it's a wonderful evening because we get to be able to say thank you to people who do things uh, that are unique, fighting fires or treating those with burn injuries. Both of those skill sets are, are something that most people could not do. We're about to see a uh, video that's put together by the team at Barnabas Health, at Barnabas um, Medical Center. And I was able to host this event one year when our good friend Billy Rafferty couldn't be there that's one right. year, who's been doing it for 30 years. Yeah. And I just was so moved by the stories, by the people, by their families. What moves you? Of course, the stories are unbelievable. The modesty is incredible. Uh, here are firefighters who throw themselves into their work, do things that are truly miraculous, superhuman in some cases, and putting them behind a microphone is the <laughs> scariest thing they do in any given year. And that's both because they're modest uh, and proud, and uh, our burn unit workers are similarly so. They uh, do things every day that are incredible, and yet when they're acknowledged, they're very embarrassed by it. So the modesty of these great heroes and these great professionals, I think, touches all of us. And of course, we all sit there and say, but for the grace of God, we could have been a victim of a terrible fire, and thank God there are firefighters who are able to rescue us. Very appreciated. Um, they're called the Valor Awards. It's, um, it happens because St. Barnabas Medical Center, tied to the larger Barnabas Health System, decided to do this a long time ago. And these stories not only never get old, but they are more inspiring than ever before. And you'll see just a, a small part of it in this video that is so incredibly powerful. It speaks for itself. For hundreds of years, New Jersey's firefighters have safeguarded their communities with a commitment to serve and protect. Theirs is and always will be a noble and dangerous profession. New Jersey firefighters are among America's finest who go above and beyond the call every day. I'm not sure that everybody knows what they're getting into when they join the fire service, but you quickly learn um, what it's all about. You have no idea what you're getting into. Um, there's absolutely no darkness like there is in a fire. Um, like, it's it's un, unimaginable darkness. The, the, it's so dark that when you leave out of the fire, the darkness is still on you. There is no script to go from, you know? Oh, this is what you do when X, Y, and Z happens. Well, you have a guideline, but X, Y, and Z will be different every single time. While every job is different, firefighters can always rely on one important constant, the brotherhood. A retired guy told me that she said 95% of this job is in the firehouse. And I think that rings true, whether you're just, you know, making your meals together, doing housework, doing maintenance, you know, and you get to know guys you're talking while you're doing your work, and you get to know one another, you talk about families, and and you just basically become a second family. And I think that's where that trust comes from. Describing the brotherhood to somebody who's not a part of it, to a civilian, is, is a very, very hard thing to do. Um, I don't think it's, it's, it's close to impossible to explain to somebody who doesn't experience it. Um, when we come to work, and every firefighter will tell you, we are like brothers. We sit down and eat together, we bust our chops together, but when that bell goes off and it's time to go to work, we go to work and it's all business. As soon as that call comes in, we start thinking about the job and we don't stop thinking about the job until the job is over. I mean, you see things that the general public, you know, for the most part, will never see. Um, and you're in that situation together, it's pretty much unspoken. You know, usually there's those calls, you know, if you lose a child or an infant, you know, you just, you don't talk about it, you might mention it. 
If you have somebody that understands what you're going through and you can go home and have a shoulder to, I mean, have a shoulder to lay your head on, it, is definitely, it definitely helps a lot. In the fire service, family support makes a difference and significant others play a significant role. I'm not the only one that's in the fire service. My wife's in the fire service. My four-year-old boy's in the fire service. It's hard on them, too, that, that you're not there for that stuff. You know, it's, it's more on my wife, more for her to do. As far as my wife goes, you know, uh, for her to, uh, you know, worry, you know, that you're at the firehouse, you know, and she's got to worry, is, is he coming home the next day? It is a dangerous job, and I'm sure that played on her mind. The sacrifices families make have supported firefighters and communities for hundreds of years. For many firefighters, firefighting is a family affair. I'm a third generation firefighter. Uh, my father was a firefighter, my grandfather's, my uncle. Was, basically everybody in my family was firefighters. So uh, I, I was kind of born into it. Uh, I was born in a firehouse, as you know, some guys would say. I look forward to coming to work the day before my shift even starts. And you know, that right there just shows me, you know, I don't think there's anything better. People like firefighters, and the reason they like firefighters is because we're always there, we're always there to help. Uh, this community that we serve here in, in this neighborhood of Station One, people knock on the door for all kinds of things, and we're always willing to help. If we're here, we help them. Even more satisfying is the feeling firefighters get from saving a life and making a difference. And even though firefighters routinely earn the title of hero by anyone's definition, they wholeheartedly resist the label. I think the hero label is reserved for people who do something like that isn't their job, you know, for the civilian that does something, or, you know, this is my job, I get paid to do this, so, yeah, you may have something like a rescue or that, but that's why I'm here. One on One with Steve Adubato at NJ Pack has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence and by the New Jersey Performing Arts Center in cooperation with NJTV and 13 for WNET. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato at NJ Pack has been provided by TD Bank, United Airlines, Verizon Communications, the Fidelco Group, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, Cohn Resnick, and by the law firm of Gibbons PC. Promotional support provided by The Record, North Jersey's trusted source, and NorthJersey.com. And by NJ Biz, all business, all New Jersey. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. When you work in a public school, you're a part of the community. So when Superstorm Sandy hit, the school employees jump right in to help. The middle school here served as a refuge for people who were forced from their homes. We all pitched in to help. Custodians, cafeteria workers, teacher aides, mechanics, groundskeepers, all pitching in to help out. School employees are part of a team, whether it's to help educate our children or to recover from a terrible tragedy. That's why I'm so proud to be a member of the NJEA.